Hello. Hello, friends. Uh, new friends and old friends with us. Welcome to the Scripture Habit. Welcome to this resource, community, space, I don't know, whatever we can be for you. Our goal is to help you develop the habit of getting into Scripture every day. It's a worthy habit. It really is. It's life transforming, faith maturing. But we know it's not always easy. So we show up and we say, hey, we'll meet with you and we'll read scripture together. My name's Rebecca Palmatier. I'm a pastor. I get to be a host here at the Scripture Habit and I say welcome. And uh, we are almost done with the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 21, which is the last chapter. We're going to do part one today. Um, I'm hoping we're going to get through as much as I think we are. Um, if not, we'll have tomorrow too. Good morning, Flo. Mm, man, I want to hear more about what happened, Flo. I appreciated your message with the update. I've been praying. Let me go ahead and share <clears throat> on my Facebook page while we wait a minute for friends to join. Let's see. Let me know that the signal and everything is good, too, if you could. Live now. Are we good? Last, mm -hmm. last chapter, full of power. Okay, let's see. Yeah, let me know guys that the signal and everything is great. Let me make sure. Yeah, I'm not muted, we're good, here we go. Okay, thank you, Flo. All right, let's go ahead and pray. We've got a lot to go through today. I hope I'm not gonna move us at too fast of a pace, but. I do want us to finish the Gospel of John this week, which means we have today and tomorrow. So let's do it. Bill, good morning. Good morning. Great to see you from Cincinnati. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, your presence, your spirit, your word alive in our hearts. Lord, thank you. Be with us. Speak to us. Holy Spirit, reveal your word in a new and powerful way in our heart. Help it come alive, we ask. Amen. Amen. Okay. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd love for us to get to through these two sections. I'm going to go ahead and do section one first before we read section two, just in case like we kind of stop midway. So let's go ahead and read the scripture of the first part and then um, we'll just work our way through. Here we go. The gospel according to John. We're almost done. Next week, we'll be starting a new book. I'm excited. And uh, if you have any requests, let me know, by the way. Uh, put it in the comments or send a message. Okay. Let's go ahead and read this first section. <coughs> Excuse me. Apologize. Got a little tickle. <clears throat> verse 21. I'm sorry. Oh, that says 21. It's chapter 21. Verse 1. <laughs> After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called twin, Nathaniel from Cana and of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We're coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them. You don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish the disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off, and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from land, about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. 
Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Good morning, Darlene. Good morning. Okay. We have this moment, and chances are you, you recognize it. You probably heard it, right? Um, Jesus on the shore, and the disciples are going, and they're having a rough day trying to catch fish. They can't catch anything. And then Jesus tells them, oh, just put your net on the other side. And then, yeah. Okay. There's questions about John chapter 21, and I thought, let's just, let's just lay this out real fast. Yesterday, when we read the last part of 20, it felt like an end, didn't it? The purpose of this gospel, right? I've, I've included these things so that you may believe and have life in his name, that you'd believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that you'd have life in his name, right? Good morning, Stephanie. Many would say, well, that feels like the end. And then suddenly we have this moment in 21. And so there's been question about it. You know, someone would say, was this uh, added on? Is this not authentic to the gospel? I'm telling you. So scholars, when they study chapter 21, they do feel a strong sense that it's written by the same person. The linguistics, the style considerations all point to the same guy. All right? Um, there is no version of the gospel that doesn't have 21. And so some might think um, they view this as an, as an epilogue. So something at the end, kind of like a bonus. Uh, but honestly, there is a very beautiful reason why this is included. It, it really does make the gospel, this account of John, complete in a way that it would not have been if it stopped where it did, all right? So is it possible that this chapter was written after this, like a first draft version? It's possible, really possible, but it was so early enough that it's believed to, to just been included by the original author. It's not actually believed to be like something thrown in after. Okay, so we're gonna go through this pretty fast, right? The author mentions that Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples. Now there's only seven disciples that are here and we see most of them are kind of mentioned, right? Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James and John, and two others. This is, this is interesting. Verse three, Simon Peter, and it, it's mentioning him as Simon Peter, not just Peter. That always makes me pause for a moment. Simon Peter says, I'm going fishing. And then they follow, probably because he's like a leader. And there's this question of everything that's happened, right? And, and Jesus had revealed himself to them prior to now. And yet Paul or Peter uh, says, I need to go fishing. Some pose this question. Uh, is he going back to his old work? Is he going back? You know, like this, this whole thing has changed into something else. And, you know, he's got to provide for his family. They got to eat. And so they decide they're going to lean into what they know, their strength, which is fishing, right? There's questions about that. What his motivation would have been? And, and we don't know. Uh, but we do see this, that even with their experience, their expertise, right? That night, they went out and caught nothing. And it's believed that they would be more likely to have caught something at night than they would have during the day. So the fact that they went out even at night and they caught nothing, how defeating that must have felt. And especially if there was any type of urgency or need of, I need to get food to feed my family or I need to provide in some way. How heartaching or disappointing uh, heavy that would have felt that they were out all night and caught nothing. <laughs> Bill, Bill says they were rusty. <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah. Uh, verse four, I just uh, italicized this because 
It's beautiful, and, and we don't know if he was meaning to do it on purpose or not, but the fact that he mentions daybreak and he mentions Jesus coming, uh, it does almost have this feeling of resurrection, you know? New day, here he comes. So just beautiful. We don't know if he did that on purpose, but it kind of feels like he did. And if there's anything I know about John, every word of his is, is shaped in there on purpose. Yeah. So verse five says, Jesus calls them friends from the shore. They don't know that it's him, but he's like, but he, he makes this, this statement. It isn't just a question. Hey, do you have any fish? It's like he knows they don't, right? They say no. They're answering this person on the shore yelling to them. And then he says, oh, just put your net on the right side of the boat and then you'll find some, right? I'm sure, uh, like if they had no inkling that it was Jesus, they probably would have been annoyed that someone from the shore is trying to tell them how to do their job when they're, when they're experts, right? You've had moments, I've had moments like that, right? Someone trying to tell me something that, you know, I do, I do know, right? But they're exhausted and disappointed. But I also wonder, was that the first little glimmer of who it might be? Maybe, right? And he's shown up twice before. He'd appear and then he'd disappear. So they do what he says, and, and you, you wouldn't think moving a net to another side of the boat wouldn't make a difference. But they do. They, they do it, and suddenly it says they're unable to haul it in because there's so many fish. And it's that moment, right? All of this is accumulating in this, in this experience. It says the disciple, the one Jesus loved, John. We believe it's John. We believe it's the author, right? So he said to Peter, it's the Lord. That's the Lord. How else would this happen, right? How? Oh, of course, it's him, you know. We should have known. And then it says Peter's response. When Simon Peter had heard that it was the Lord, it said he tied his outer clothing around him. He'd taken it off, put it back on. Don't know if he kind of like took part of his shirt off. I mean, they were out all night trying to find something. You really kind of don't know, but the detail is given. And so it says he tied his outer clothing around him and then he plunged into the sea. And man, that sounds like Peter. Sounds like Peter. Let me just leave all the other disciples to deal with this net full of fish that we can't haul because suddenly Jesus is there. And uh, in the words of N.T. Wright, Peter has unfinished business with Jesus. I want you to remember the last encounter that Peter had with Jesus one-on-one -on -one. because Jesus had shown himself to the disciples. Um, he had revealed himself some, but that Simon Peter hasn't been able to have a moment since his last one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, which was leading to the garden. It was the night of the last supper when Jesus looked at him and said, do you really love me? Would you really give your life for me? Because you're going to deny me three times. So Peter now is like, I'm not going to let this moment pass. There's been two other moments where Jesus has shown up and this, we, we need to, to meet up. I need to see him, right? I can picture that with him. And he's so determined. He just jumps right off into the water and goes the hundred yards and leaves the disciples to, to deal with the rest, right? And you see for Peter even too, what's most important. I mean, he's just had the biggest haul probably of his life. All the, the fish, he can't even hold it. And, and there is risk in that. They're actually going to point to the nets not being broken, which is beautiful because if you had caught so many, there's a possibility you could lose it all. If the nets broke, you would lose all that you had caught and you'd be out for days fixing the nets. Big problem, big risk. But to Simon Peter, that means nothing if Jesus is on the sea right there. I love verse 9 when, when it says, when they got out on land, they saw, and this is what they saw, a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it already and bread. And I, I just, my observation, Jesus already had what he needed and what they needed, 
right? Warm fire, fish and bread. And, and we see a theme of fish and bread. Hey, that was like the diet of the day, right? Uh, but we can remember, as we see fish and bread together, we can remember other moments where Jesus has done things with fish and bread, right? Yeah. Tell me what you're thinking as we go through. So verse 10, Jesus tells him, bring some of the fish that you've caught, right? I write that Jesus invites Peter to add to what Jesus has already gathered himself. Add to it. You, you bring some of yours too. There's so much symbolism in that. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, but I also point to this idea, okay, so if Jesus has already gathered some himself, he's inviting Simon to be a part to contribute something to this big meal that's about to be shared. And it almost feels celebratory, right? Because they just had this huge catch, uh, this miraculous moment. And it just kind of makes me feel like it's the energy of that of like a celebration or a feast coming, you know. Uh, and then here's the, the part where the writer makes sure to say, even though there were so many fish, the net was not torn. And that is another demonstration of it being Jesus right? The perfect provision. It's not something that gets in your hand and then it's lost. Jesus invites him to have breakfast. Come, have breakfast, right? Uh, it says none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew. They knew by this point it's the Lord. And so we, uh, we've been planting this church here in this rural mountain town. We're actually about to have the grand opening the first weekend in May. This whole uh, gathering with the community on Saturday. We're going to serve, we're going to celebrate, and then a dedication service on Sunday. But So when we've been doing this church plant, um, a, a lot of our gatherings involve food. They do. Actually, we have dinner church on Thursday night where we share a meal together, family style. And... I, I point to how Jesus did stuff with food a lot, you know, because it's not just food. It's the, the gathering. It's the, the communing together. So I just smile every time it mentions Jesus and food. And he's inviting people, come share a meal with me, or I'm going to share a meal with you. Yeah, very personal. It says Jesus took the bread, right? He took the bread, and then he gave it to him. He took the fish, and he gave it to him. Again, we think of the moment where he took the bread and he prayed over it and he distributed it and it fed 5,000 men plus women and children, right? And the writer says, this is now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. I think uh, I think it was the Pillar New Testament commentary that, that says um, the third time uh, in the gospel that John has accounted. Okay. Let's get into the second part because this builds, it, it really is together. I debated doing this separate and then I thought, well, that could put, I'd rather like have us do it now today and then we can go a little bit lighter tomorrow, but then review the gospel to close out, right? So there's this moment then, right? Peter's wanted to speak with Jesus. Um, they've had this thing hanging in the air that's, uncertain, unresolved, and, there, and there's some pain there, right? So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know I love you. And then Jesus says, feed my lambs. Now what we don't know, what I've been curious about, um, it doesn't say that they went off to the side and talked. We, we kind of don't know. Is Jesus doing this in front of everybody or not? I see beauty in, in either way because I don't, I don't know if the other disciples know that, you know, specifically about Peter's denial of Jesus three times in this moment. You know, do they know specifically what, what Peter did? Uh, they, they weren't necessarily around, but maybe they do. Maybe there could have even been rumblings if someone else heard Jesus tell Peter, you're going to deny me three times. 
And Peter, who's been a leader, you know, he's just like this natural born leader among the disciples. Like, what does that mean? So it doesn't say that Jesus took him to the side. And so I'm going to, I'm going to picture in my mind as this is rolling out that perhaps he didn't, perhaps this is in front of everybody. So first thing I point out, Jesus calls him uh, Simon, which is his old name. Remember, Jesus had given him a new name, Peter, which means the rock. He says, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, Peter. But now he's calling him by his old name. It's after he's denied Jesus, and Peter actually went back to his old, to his old profession, didn't he? Jesus knows what he's doing, right? So he calls Simon son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, yes, I love you. The love there, by the way, and, and I'll point this uh, later, there are different words of love that are being used here. And at first, Jesus, the love that he's using here is the agape love, uh, which is, which is, as some would say, a deeper love. It's, it's a love that's from God. Uh, the, re the response of, you know that I love you, actually is not a, it's not the agape love that Peter says back to him. He actually says phileo, which is like a brotherly love. There's kind of a play on these words just a little. Uh, we don't think that, that Peter was purposely saying that he loved him less. Uh, so it's, it's just kind of an interesting that both of these loves ended up being, being used. So first thing he says is, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. And then we see Jesus does this a second time. Second time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Ooh, by the way, ooh, go back for a second. First time he says, do you love me more than these? Right? And there's this question. What is he referring to when he says more than these? And we don't know exactly. Could it be, um, do you love me more than this life of fishing and more than this life? Do you love me more than this stuff? Do you love me more than you love them, the disciples? Could be. Could also be Jesus saying, Simon, do you love me more than the, disciple, more than the other disciples do? Could be any of those we we don't know because the way the the language is so second time he says now do you love me and and peter says yes yes lord you, you know that i love you so jesus says now instead of feed my lambs he says shepherd my sheep and then he does it a third time he asked he said simon son of john do you love me it says Peter was grieved that he had asked him a third time. Peter was grieved. And we don't know, what was it about the grieving? Uh, one scholar source suggested, did the third time be this like very big reminder that's hanging in the air that reminds Peter about how he denied Jesus three times. And so Jesus is asking him over and over again as if he doesn't really love him, right? Uh, you also wonder, is he also grieved? Because Jesus is asking, asking him again, almost as if it's a question, like, does he not know when Peter's saying, I love you? And is he doing it in front of the others? We don't know for sure, but we can see there's definitely this connection with the fact that Peter denied Jesus three times. So, and, and the third time, so Peter says, Lord, you know everything. You, you know that I love you, right? Pausing a minute, I just think about what feelings might have been in Peter's heart in that moment, you know? If Jesus were asking you, yeah, wait a minute, I know you said it, but do you really love me? Because last time, you said you would lay your life down, and I questioned you on it, right? Mm. 
So Jesus now says this phrase a third time. It's, it's a variation though, it's a little different. First it was, feed my lambs. Then it was, shepherd my sheep. And then it was, feed my sheep. Now here's the thing, we're stopping here today. That's where we're stopping. But I want us to reflect on this section because they go together. Even though, listen, it's not done. Tomorrow we're gonna see Jesus is further communicating with Peter. Uh, Because we're literally stopping kind of in the middle of the moment. But I want you to see the symbolism of this chapter and this moment, why it really does make the gospel more complete. All right? Um, One, we see fishing symbolism. What I mean by that is fishers of men. Do you remember that? Where Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And Peter goes back to fishing fish, right? Uh, But fishers of men refer to to being one that was called to go out and share the gospel, right? To build the church. If we're seeing that fishing symbolism, then we also need to notice the provision. The provision symbolism. Because see, even though they were experts, they caught nothing in their own strength, did they? And they were probably really discouraged, right? They thought in that moment, Jesus isn't here, I'm gonna go do what I know I can do. And then they can't even do that until Jesus is there. And then Jesus gives them direction. And then they're able to accomplish in a profound way what what they had wanted to do and couldn't do on their own. You see, you see this connection, um, and, and I think this is absolutely a deep message for the church, right? Apart from him, you can do nothing, not even building his church, friend. We need Jesus. And, and the danger, if we think, if we, and, and I don't think anyone like, let me set this down for a second, I don't think anyone willingly says, I'm going to build my church without Jesus, right? Of course not. But we're not careful if we start to get really weighed down of all the other stuff around us and we start to think I have to find a solution and before you know it you're really you're probably going to start operating in your own strength trying to build and sustain what was never meant to be done apart from Jesus so we see that. We, we see that this moment, yes, it's Jesus appearing again. Yes, it's, it has fish and it has bread and it has, it has Jesus talking with Peter, right? But, but this, this is significant because it includes the mission of the church. And we see that too. So because Jesus communicates that when he does the, the three things that I'm asking you to do, right? And if you think about this, every gospel has has this type of ending. It's not just that Jesus died and was raised, but there is this call then that the church has something to do. We have a job to do, right? And Jesus is specifically saying it right now. Feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep, and feed my sheep, all right? Feed, shepherd, feed. So there's provision, Uh, as far as feeding and and helping them grow and nurturing and caring, providing, right, for little, little, little ones and then ones that have have been growing, sheep and lambs. And then there's this word shepherd, which is actively protecting and guiding, leading, taking responsibility for. But, But look at the word, though. Whose lambs and whose sheep are they? They're Jesus's, right? Feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep, and feed my sheep. The agapao and the phileo. So I point this out. The words that were used, a lot of a, like, we feel they're used together. They're used cohesively as synonyms. It's not like they're actually creating a hierarchy of love here. But both are required. Both are required. Listen, you cannot love God and hate people. 
I need to say that again. You cannot love God and hate people because loving God, having that agapo love, agapo love is going to require that you also have phileo love. You have to have a love for mankind. You have to have a, a God view of the people around you. You hear what I'm saying? And, and that's necessary because there's a lot of people that'll say, I love God, but I don't like his church. Come on, that'll preach. You know it will, right? Yeah. <laughs> so these synonyms are used together on purpose, agape and phileo. It is the type of love. We're supposed to embody both. We're supposed to love God and love our neighbor, right? Isn't that the great, the, the great commandment, the greatest commandment Jesus said? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself, right? Agape and phileo. We have to, we have to do it, right? Uh, and then I point out whose lambs and whose sheep are they? They're Jesus's. They're not ours. Jesus didn't say, okay, take care of your flock, shepherd. He said, take care of mine. And then the very last thing we see in this is we do see something beautiful. And that is that Simon Peter is given three chances to say yes to Jesus. Right? Three chances to say yes after he's denied three times. And he does it in, in, in my view, it's an earshot, if not right there in front of the rest of the disciples. Peter has a chance to make it up. Yeah? There's more to this that we're going to build on, tom on tomorrow. So we're going to stop here for today. But I want you to catch it. Think about, think about Jesus' provision. Think about the fishing symbolism, the, the provision symbolism. Think about, um, think about the, the love that's being talked about, the love that's required, and what Jesus is asking Peter and us, his church, to do. The mission of the church. Yeah, we'll pick up tomorrow. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the challenge, Lord. We cannot say we love you and, and hate your creation and hate people. Lord, I pray that you'd stir up in us that agape love and the phileo love, that, that we would have your heart for mankind, your heart for our neighbor, not just the neighbors we get along with or the neighbors that look like us or think like us or vote like us, but Lord, you would give us a love for mankind, that we could demonstrate your love in how we love and serve you and how we love and serve our neighbor. We ask in your name, amen. Amen. Do me a favor, hit the share button. Can you do that? Wrapping up John. Oh, it's so good. And tomorrow will be our last study in this gospel. Yeah. As a reminder, if you have requests for where we go next, I have um, I have a few, play, like there's a couple books that I kind of have waiting that I think, oh, wait, we might do that one next. We might do that one. I'd love to hear from you. New Testament, Old Testament. Uh, we, we just finished a gospel, so I probably wouldn't go into a gospel again, but uh, do we want to do some of the writings? Do we want to do maybe a, a prophet? Uh, some of the narrative uh, history of God's people in the Old Testament? Or uh, go into a New Testament letter? I'd love it if you would tell me. Yeah? Have a great day, guys. I'll see you tomorrow.